Welcome to Grit with Wisdom. This is the podcast that delves deep into the inner psyche of mountain bikers from all walks of life in order to discover the tools and the tactics that can help us have more fun out on the trails more often. Our aim here is to help you understand what it takes to push our own personal boundaries in the sport we love from a mental and emotional perspective. Today, I was lucky enough to sit down for a chat and then go for a ride with Ollie Lothorpe. Ollie is a professional mountain biker based out of Squamish here in BC. Originally from Jersey in the Channel Islands off of the UK, his roots lie in XC racing, having competed from a young age and most notably made it to the Commonwealth Games in Australia back in 2018. These days, his riding taste has evolved to match the gnarly environment that he now calls home much of which he captures and posts on his popular YouTube and Instagram pages, which are known for steep granite slabs, stylish flow, and of course, the infamous rubber ducky on his handlebars. We dig into some of the challenges with pressure and injury that he faced during his racing days, and how that has now shaped his laid-back, do-it-for-fun approach to riding. This has led to a healthier relationship with things like assessing risks, fear whilst riding, and self-belief. This allows him to ride some pretty nerve-wracking terrain. Listen in as we dissect these processes, give you a couple of tools, and of course, have a laugh or two along the way. Enjoy. Hey, Oli. Welcome to the show, man. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here hanging out with me on the North Shore for the day. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, man. So we've just been having a coffee, getting to know each other a little bit. Uh, and I'm super excited to get into this conversation and talk a little bit more about you, your mindset and your mountain biking. Yeah. Maybe it would be really cool though to have you start just by telling our audience here a little bit about yourself, where are you from and what is it that you do? Yeah, so I'm Ollie Lothal. <laughs> uh, I basically grew up in Jersey Channel Islands, which for anybody that doesn't know where that is, it's a little island in between the UK and France, a little 8 by 14 kilometer island <laughs> with not a huge amount of, amount of uh, mountain biking. And yeah, I am a mountain biker, I guess. <laughs> there you go, man. So that was one of my first questions. From the Channel Islands there in between England and France, Yeah. part of the UK, where did you ride growing up? Did you ride bikes? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I spent, right, my dream was kind of always to race downhill and do more extreme things, but being on such a small island with our downhill, like our longest downhill being maybe a minute, okay. <laughs> it wasn't really a viable thing. So I grew up racing road uh, race, uh, oh my gosh, doing road racing and cross country racing. So for us, basically every racing discipline that I could, other than downhill, <laughs> um mainly doing cross country um and yeah the, the island is honestly is a beautiful island and the the road riding that there is 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 awesome um there's a as a coastal cliff path that we uh we used to go and ride on there was a few cross country circuits that we used to train on um but my riding now does not portray <laughs> my my past. Uh, it's yeah, compared to the uh, lycra and now the full faces, it's a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, man, that's fantastic. I always find it so fascinating to hear, you know, where someone's been from and and what their upbringing was like yeah. compared to what they're doing now. And we'll get into that more in a second. Uh, I do have to stop and ask though. You know, being an Aussie, I do have a bit of a, a surfing background. The Channel Islands is that where the the surfboard brand comes from? Uh, which surfboard brand? Channel Island. <laughs> is there? Yeah. Uh, probably. It's big I would, I would imagine that. There's a lot of surfing on the island. Yeah. There's, um, yeah, there's a place called the Water Splash, which is this awesome little cafe and there's surfboards and stuff in there. And it looks out onto what they call is the five mile, well, beach, but it's not a St. Juan's beach, sorry. Um, and yeah, the, the surfing is, is awesome. I'm not a huge fan of cold water, so I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't surf too, too much or really go in the sea, but yeah, no, it's, it, the surfing is is really good there. Yeah, fantastic, man. Sounds like a beautiful place uh, to grow up. And thinking back to your upbringing or your your teenage years, what was it that really drew you to bikes? What got you passionate about bikes in the first place? I think, well, well first off, it was my my dad. <laughs> he, okay. uh, yeah, like put me put me on a bike when I was young and took me to my my first race when I was eight, and I 
happened to win that race and then oh. ever since that one win i was kind of just chasing that like i i was racing was always my main focus and i was either kind of training okay. for for racing or i was out in the woods trying to make little jumps and stuff with my buddies normally crashing my cross country bike <laughs> <Love> <laughs> super it. steep head angle going over the bars and stuff yeah. but yeah it was it was fun that's awesome so you kind of took a like into the racing right from a young age yeah yeah i was racing all the way up until 2018 okay. so from yeah, I started taking it seriously when I was like 14 or something. Um, and then all the way up until 21. So what was it about the racing that you think you really liked? Was it, you know, the actual competing or training, having a focus? What was it that really drew you there? I think like my mindset of riding has changed massively. But back then it it was winning. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> like you I, enjoyed the feeling. Yeah, I, I, I really, I really did enjoy racing and winning. Like just the, the feeling of doing a cross country race and feeling fit and being able to actually race the whole race was just an awesome feeling it wasn't so awesome when you weren't feeling <laughs> really good and you're yeah. slogging yourself around and it was the same kind of thing with, with road racing like when you when you feel fit and you're like going up a climb and everyone's going as high as you can and you're going as high as you can too and there's people dropping everywhere it's just it's just really fun <laughs> totally man. and i think i can even relate you know from the level of a hobbyist like when you're feeling fit and you're feeling yeah. good on the bike it's awesome it's so enjoyable yeah. uh, and perhaps when you're on the opposite end of the scale maybe after a break or a setback that's yeah. not quite as enjoyable until you put the work in and got back no in. yeah with with racing there is a hell of a lot of work that goes in to to it compared to i guess what i do now somewhat so it's different different work yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah interval training compared to braking control training <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, exactly right. it's a little bit more chill so while we're on the subject of your racing like i'd love to talk about you know kind of where that took you the places that took you and, and some of the bigger competitions you got to before moving here to bc yeah so i mean like the whole reason i ended up in bc was for for training um i like my whole childhood yeah, yeah again i was i was always racing never really rode too much for fun other than like because i'm just messing about on some some jumps so needed somewhere to train and i was training for the for the commonwealth games which was the the biggest race that i ever did um so the yeah the, the racing brought me here for training Fantastic. um but the first yeah i didn't actually know really what i was getting into when i was coming to squamish like i'd always wanted to go to whistler uh, but i messaged cycling canada and a gentleman called mike sharuk who was the bc provincial part a uh, uh, coach at the time he uh he let me come and stay at his house and i oh, spent okay. the whole summer r riding here and it was kind of the first time i'd ridden for fun really huh. um more so than train like i just came out and rode for for months and it was it was awesome um but yeah then ended up getting to the commonwealth games which was a huge huge goal for myself did the the road race and the cross-country mountain bike um unfortunately I, I did break my collarbone oh. seven weeks before the games so I, I went to new zealand uh training before the games and uh yeah met a tree that wasn't too friendly <laughs> it was it was such a ridiculous crash i was actually on a on a hiking and biking trail getting oh. to some trails <laughs> and there was just this like 90 degree corner that i didn't realize and it it stepped away and my my front wheel went over and i started going over the handlebars oh, not fast at all um but because i was going o otb i hit the the tree with my left handlebar and then my body weight went forwards and it wasn't even the initial impact that broke it it was kind of the push afterwards as i went over the bar oh, no. <laughs> yeah and then that was so i i i didn't do amazingly in the games but Man, i you got there, there and i, I yeah, yeah i wasn't last <laughs> in itself. yeah it was it was a very long time yeah and now like it was three years of my life training so to done get to those games almost three years of training you're out in squamish <laughs> you're you're feeling the fun of riding yeah for one of the first times it sounds like you know taking maybe a less serious approach to some rides which must, yeah. must have been great but then you have this you know <laughs> this horribly un unlucky accident there on yeah the easy how did that affect your your mentality going into the games afterwards it was honestly mixed feelings like there had been so much pressure for the for the games from kind of everybody and also the, the pressure i put on my myself and when it 
when it happened, like I'd always say, yeah, I've been racing for a long time and unfortunately been dealing with back problems, which that affected the mental side a lot more than the, the break. And I think in some ways the break was almost a, a weird relief, if I'm honest. Huh. Like it, it was a no pressure. Like I was then going to the games and there was no pressure to perform. I see. Um, and it just made it an actual really fun time it was the funnest race i've i've ever done like it wasn't i didn't do amazing but i had so much fun like the crowd was incredible and the climbs were not as fun after not really riding for seven weeks <laughs> <laughs> and I'd, I'd only been mountain biking three times okay. before before i was on the the course like we wow. did um one day of training and i I actually crashed and landed on that collarbone. Oh, <laughs> on the, it was hilarious. No better was, way to uh, test. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that was one of the GB guys, and I was like, "Dude, look at this sick gap I found." <laughs> and just like hooked up a, a pedal on a rock and went flying over the bars <laughs> behind me. <laughs> but it was uh, an immediate. Oh, my collarbone was on hundred percent after that. So now nah, the, the race was awesome. Just going on the downhills, like I was throwing at that time. I wasn't too skillful, but like throwing one hands and just like cheering for the crowd and i was going up uh up one of the hills and uh, there was a bunch of new zealand guys who were like wheelie wheelie <laughs> and again there was no pressure so i just yeah I popped a wheelie and i was going up the climb and everyone was cheering <laughs> it was it was such an awesome experience but, that's, that's fantastic yeah it yeah. sounds like such great times looking back on that yeah it's so interesting for me as well hearing how you know that injury and that setback shifted your whole perspective for the race yeah, like it, there was so much pressure with those games. Like I, like I said, and the back problems had been a, an issue for like two, well, a real issue for like two years. Mm. Um, and I'd been working really hard to to kind of sort that. But the the games were unfortunately the end of my cross country racing. Um, like I saw saw team doctors there and stuff who figured out the muscle imbalances that I had created from riding from such a young age and doing gym work and stuff that it was basically I had to quit riding um, or just be in constant pain for basically ever. And I, I still, I still unfortunately do suffer with some back problems, but they're not nowhere near as bad as they, <laughs> they, they used to, they used to be. Yeah. It's a horrible ultimatum to be given as someone that had built their life around cycling yeah and i'm guessing that a lot of your happiness at the time came from being able to get out there and ride your bike yeah yeah pretty I mean, <laughs> it still is and i think it always has and probably always will be um yeah i like, honestly for for a mindset point it wasn't fantastic the beauty thing with cycling though is it didn't end like just mm. because like it was actually pedaling that was the the issue um so I, I wasn't able to really race anymore. However, I could still go riding. It wasn't like the end of the world. So I just got on my dirt jumper and started playing around, really. Like, I, I was a bit over the, the pedaling some, yeah. somewhat. I think a lot of people listening are going to be saying, <laughs> yes, pedaling's bad, don't do that. No, no, pe pedaling's <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> um, but... Yeah, it was uh, it, it was a tough time, but again, yeah, cycling is awesome in that just because you can't do one thing, there's so many other ways that you can do, and, and r reverse way as well, like doing jumping and all the gnarly stuff. Now, if that ever stops, like last year, breaking my kneecap, I was able to ride just super chill stuff. So, and for me, just, even just being on a bike, it makes me happy. So being able to ride around town is honestly enough. Like as long as I'm on a bike, it makes me happy. It doesn't yeah. have to be gnarly <laughs> no that's fantastic we are lucky it's such a broad sport isn't it it's not like yeah you know swimming where you can't swim you can't swim yeah <laughs> it's like, okay i can't ride this bike which other bike could i ride yeah i love that and uh you know how did you find that shift from you know being a competitive rider solely focused on training and competing moving towards you know being a rider that's just out there to have fun and, and riding whichever bike you can at the time how did you find that it was, experience. it was a, it was difficult, honestly, because my whole life and my whole ideal life was racing mm. mountain bikings. To take the racing side away was it was difficult at first, and like I said, the, the all the messing about definitely helped my mental state. However, there always was that bit in the back of my mind, and it took me two years, honestly, to to kind of get 
over it. I was always like, no, I'm going to get back to racing. Mm. I'm going to get back to racing. And it was only until I started really, and I, I guess, doing gnarlier stuff and realizing that I wasn't too bad at going downhill <laughs> that the, the mindset kind of switched from, you know what, I'm actually all right just riding and having having fun um but it was all i, th I think it was also a, a realization that mountain like being being a professional mountain bike which was all my mountain biker was oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> uh being a professional mountain biker was always my my goal and realizing that you don't have to race bikes to be a professional mountain biker was a huge huge switch that's the fantastic thing isn't it about our sport evolving getting bigger yeah is there's so many more ways that you can fit into this community and into this industry yeah without having to be a, a top performing racer on the podium yeah. at every stage <laughs> <laughs> oh man i love it it's so cool hearing about how some of these you know potentially moments that you may have viewed as like a negative event in your life have then spurred this you know amazing period of growth and all of yeah. these <laughs> new wonderful things so yeah for anyone out there experiencing a setback or you know maybe even like you know the death of a personality like i can't race anymore i can't do this thing that i built my whole life on like there's good stuff on the other side of that if you keep uh yeah keep seeking is having fun yeah. it is definitely yeah you have to keep on trying <laughs> there was there was definitely months and months and months in between all of that where it didn't feel like anything was happening but it does pay off if you just keep on doing it just keep sure. on riding your bike yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> i love it man so it sounds like that initial trip to squamish to do some training have some fun before the commonwealth <laughs> games was that the inspiration to move to BC full time? Yeah, I mean, I didn't even need to get to Squamish, and I always wanted, I already <laughs> wanted to move here. Like even just driving down the Sea to Sky Highway, I was just blown away. Yeah, and because yeah, I, I didn't really do much research on Squamish before I came out here. I just knew it was near Whistler. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm gonna get a bike park pass, and I'm gonna ride him up in Whistler like as much as I possibly can. I got a Whistler pass. Started riding a Scottish and used it three times. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. The the riding in Scottish is to me is it's just amazing. And even like going out for my first ride, being like, wait a minute, I recognise that feature and I recognise this and that, and being like, oh, like all of these films I've thought were filmed in in Whistler, half of them are actually in in Scottish. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Just how much there is to ride. It blew my mind as well. I know, you know, coming from Australia, similar story didn't really do any research yeah people ask me why i moved like, bikes yeah <laughs> that's it but there's just so much to ride I, I struggle every summer to ride everything that i've dreamt up over that winter yeah oh, it, it's so difficult living there like i find it hard to just leave Scottish. i'm like why <laughs> would i go and drive 45 minutes up to whistler when i can go and ride like the 400 kilometers <laughs> trail or whatever Absolutely. that we we have and you can mix it up every single time Man, it's such a good problem to have. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's real tough living there. <laughs> so let's talk about your riding now. You've kind of transitioned from riding XC, training lots, competing, to riding some pretty gnarly slab lines, jumps, things like this in Squamish. Yeah. What's a perfect ride look like for you now? What are you liking? Honestly, the, a perfect ride is just a ride. I, I don't think I really have a perfect ride in my, in my head. It's just being able to to go out on my bike and ride my bike is a perfect ride. It, it. Like it, it can be a beer run on my cruiser <laughs> <laughs> and Some it's still the best, the best thing. Yeah. Whereas equally, yeah, I can, I can go out there and ride some of the gnarliest things <laughs> and the enjoyment is still the same. There's definitely a bit more of an excitement factor when it gets gnarly, <laughs> but yeah, I don't think I really have a perfect ride great answer man one of the best i've had so far i love it so you're riding anything and everything i know a lot of the stuff we see up on your youtube channel which if people <laughs> haven't seen i'll definitely put the tag to you down in the show notes a lot of the stuff we're seeing there is really steep you know classic squamish granite slabs yeah. <laughs> roots jumps things like this when you're out there riding something that is maybe a little bit scary i've got to ask do you have any mental tools and techniques that you're consciously using so not specifically um however my my mindset for riding is don't ride it unless you're 100 mm. percent. so everything that i do ride i like i i've ridden away from features more times than i've ridden things and i 
I'm more than happy to go to a feature that I've ridden a hundred times. And if I'm not feeling that day, I will not ride it. I never push myself. Um, so say, say there is a feature that does scare the crap out of me. Yeah. <laughs> like I will go there, I will look at it, I will figure it out. I'll know exactly how to ride it. I won't ride it, I'll go away and I'll ride things that I think are similar or whether okay. it's like, say it's a drop, I'll go and find a drop that's a bit smaller and I'll go and practice doing it really slow and then doing it really fast and like trying to make something else that I'm really comfortable on as similar to the feature I'm scared about. So when I then go back to that feature, I can look at it and rather than being like, well, I'm not 100% sure, I'll go, oh, no, this is chill. Like, I I know I can do this because I've done this and I've done that. Mm. And the, yeah, the, the tools are definitely a lot further down the line than just looking at something and telling myself something. But yeah, I, I only ride things unless if I'm 100% confident that I can, I can do it. Mm. And that's a fantastic process. And I think it, it's probably, you know, it must have played a part in the fact that you haven't had a, a terrible amount of injuries and you're yeah. still able to ride, you know, at such a high <laughs> level. That it's, it's, yeah. I, re- I really love that whole process of going back, building up confidence on something that you already know you can ride, playing around with it. Yeah changing things up and then going back to the scary feature with yeah the, the, you know this kind of new sound sense of self-belief like i yeah. can do this because i did that yeah like it's and even though like it's it's going going to a feature and rather than looking at it and being scary you're not scared of it mm. i think that's the the mindset that i like to have and it's what i like other people to have if someone if i'm riding with somebody and they're questioning something yeah I'm like should you really be doing it no. Like you can you can progress in a very nice way and not hurt yourself. Yeah. <laughs> like I have had a hell of a lot of crashes, but the most of those crashes have been in a parking lot where I'm <laughs> doing cornering or whatever. Yeah. And it's just like yeah, I mean that's another thing is learning to crash. Yeah. Like actually going out and purposely learning to crash. Like I I spent one winter just doing 360s out of flyouts right? and kind of purposely under rotating and doing opposite ones and stuff and just learning how to like fall backwards and how do you and, fall well <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i, I, I know mean people throw around all kinds of things you tuck it and roll it, uh, like, it what's your... <laughs> it's different every time yeah. <laughs> and I think, again i think that's the importance of trying to trying to learn to crash in so many different ways and that's why to me a 360 is a perfect way because yep. you can I mean, you can slide wheels out and you can catch yourself with your feet and your hands, but if something really flips you around and you're going backwards, it's really difficult to save yourself. <laughs> but if you've at least, like, it's never going to be perfect, but mm-hmm. at least if you've kind of practiced it a little bit, you will have some of those body motions to, to protect you. And I've been lucky so far, and I've definitely had circumstances where I would have hurt myself if I hadn't. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. And do you think there's kind of like a, a progression there or a, a right time in a mountain biker's progression to start playing around and quote unquote learn to crash? I yeah. yeah. You you need you need to learn the, the basics first mm. um before you start doing that. But I think to me or like learning to make the mistake is always a better thing to do first than actually learn the skill. So if like manuals, for example, I think one of the best ways to learn a manual is brakeless. Mm. It's really <laughs> difficult. But I, I spent years and years and years of my life trying to manual with a brake and the brake was a hindrance for me. Like I'd, yeah. I learned how to do it holding the brake. <laughs> so it was like sweet other than the fact you're slowing yourself down constantly. So for, for now, if I'm ever trying to teach someone how to, to manual, it's either take the brake off or don't touch the brakes. And the first thing you do is learn to jump off the back. Mm. If you know how to jump off the back, you're not scared to commit 100% to it. Interesting. So it gives that rider more confidence to be able to get to that point. Because for a manual example, the the balance point is not far off where you need to jump away. <laughs> totally, because yeah. it's really scary getting to there. But yeah, if you, if you know how to jump off, you're not going to be too scared to get there. Man, it totally makes sense in my head. <laughs> Thinking about for myself personally, trying to yeah. ride without brakes on my bike <laughs> sets off alarm bells in my head, but it, it yeah. totally makes sense to me. And I might have to try this on our ride afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, flat pedals first. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love what you're saying there. It sounds to me, 
you know, a lot of your process, whether you're trying to manual or you're trying to write a new slab, is taking away as, as many of the unknowns as possible. Yeah. So that you don't have that uh, that level of kind of doubt in your head. Of, what if this happens? What if I go past the balance? Yeah. It's like, oh, I just jump off like I practice yeah. a hundred times. Yeah. Being being confident to make the mistake is mm. is good. And I mean, also when you're doing some of the gnarlier things, knowing that you can kind of make a mistake and get away with it is totally. confidence inspiring and also allows you to be able to write those things. Yeah, <laughs> both, you know, mentally and physically. Like if I lose focus, how can I refocus? Yeah. Maybe physically or technically, if I do start to lock up my brakes going down this slab, yeah. how can I regain traction or where's my next island of safety? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the front wheel sliding down slabs is one of the things I have practiced the absolute most. Like I remember for, for when I first came to Squamish, the, the rolls are so <laughs> steep. Totally. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And not having the right the right body position, like people who ride normal rock around, it's, it's a lot slipperier, so mm. you don't really have the traction that you have on the slabs. So everyone, and myself, when I first came, you ride right off the back, <laughs> yeah. butt over the rear wheel, and you're just yeah hoping for the for the best, but you don't realize that you can lean so hard into that front wheel and almost be leaning over and actually have the most unbelievable grip you've, you've ever yeah. had. It's amazing, isn't it? It's the terrain that I have not found anywhere else in the world, right? In. No. It's so unique, and you know, to the point where there's people like yourself nose manual in, down slabs that are yeah. steep under a 45 degree <laughs> angle is just yeah. insane but such a cool learning process to hear about you going out and actually practicing skidding the front wheel yeah so that if it happens you know how to deal with that in a critical moment yeah and, and i know you know same for you coaching a lot of riders the biggest thing we see is people leaning right off the back yeah using all back brake not wanting yeah. to touch their front in case they go over the handlebars yeah so how do you practice or how do you set someone up in an, an area to practice that safely. So for, I mean, for, for sliding the front wheel mm. um, and also pretty much all skills that I like, so cornering and bunny hop and everything, I think a gravel parking lot is mm. the best place. <laughs> um, always flat pedals too, when somebody's learning clips are a hindrance. It's a great um, one. Yeah, for everyone <laughs> listening, I know that's another question I get you know, <laughs> almost every week out there coaching. Yeah. What's better, flats or clips? The answer is neither. Yeah. But some things are better for certain stages in your progression or yeah. certain styles of riding. So I think for, for all learning, flats is, is the best mm. way because you, you do have to use the correct technique. And myself included, being a cross-country racer from a young age, like I learn how to do everything with clips. So when I bunny hopped, I did the classic just <laughs> pull front and rear up. Totally. How did you find that <laughs> transition, the... putting flats on your bike again? And... He was, well, I, I did the transition by getting a dirt jumper. Okay. Yep. So and, and this has stayed true to today, where my mountain bikes have, have clips on them. Un unless I'm doing something specific where I want flats on or I'm going to go and practice something. Okay. But my, my dirt jumper is the tool for learning everything everything so flat pedals on there learn everything on the dirt jumper and then take it to the trails with the the big bike minimum technology maximum technique yeah <laughs> yeah and then you take those skills back to the norco range yeah. <laughs> with 180 mil of travel and it's like you've got the best of both worlds yeah yeah fantastic man i, I love that philosophy um i wanted to ask you know for yourself you're obviously pushing the limits pushing your limits exploring doing new things all the time yeah. on a mountain bike how do you go about setting yourself goals that are achievable you know fun and challenging yet not so far out of, <laughs> out of your wheelhouse that it like you know stresses you and it's too hard yeah and i don't like stress personally <laughs> Weird, <laughs> weirdly yeah so i i don't really specifically set myself goals that are either achievable or unachievable like i'll there are things I want to ride, but like I said before, like I, I'm not going to ride them unless I'm 100% confident. Mm. So, you know, I'll, I used the Garanga drop for for an example. I still haven't ridden that. Um, I really want to. I think I I think I have the skill to be able to to do it. Um, but I just haven't been there, looked at it, and gone, yeah, I'm 100%. Mm -hmm. I could probably go there and throw myself off it and be fine. Yeah. But I haven't been there and looked at it and be like yeah i'm 100 percent and it's the yeah it goes for for all of the gnarly things that i'm looking at and things i have planned in the future 
to me, nothing is crazy out of the stretch. Like I've never looked at something and been like, wow, one day I'm going to do that <laughs> ridiculous looking slab. It's kind of just going to the top of something and figuring it out and being like, yeah, does it work? Does it not work? Mm. And then, yeah, one day you look at it and you go, oh, I can totally 100% do this. And that's kind of how I've got to riding what I am now. Yeah, so listening to that intuition. Yeah. Yeah, I love that, man. I think it takes, you know, 100% more courage to walk away from something. The, yeah. the example there of the Garanga drop, like you're saying, yeah, I, I think I could do this. I could do this. You've probably got people telling you, oh, dude, you've totally got that. Yeah. You should just do it. <laughs> yeah. But if you're not feeling it, it takes so much more courage to say, like, I'm just not going to do it because I don't feel like doing it. And that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I, it should be okay. And it's something I have seen in mountain biking. I think I almost see more and more is people go like having something in their mind that mm. they're like i'm want to do this or i'm going to do this and yeah going there and running in seven times looking at it getting off the bike moving a rock moving a stick like just being like this is my goal i need to do this versus like yeah i, I want to do it but i'm okay not it, doing yeah it like, raises I, the question isn't it? it's like well why do you want to do this yeah, and is well, it because you think you you should have to do it, or you should be able to do it, or is it because you actually think it's going to be fun and you yeah feel like doing it today? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think social media has has helped that, and I'm honestly probably part of the problem with with that. Like people, I I see things that other people ride, and I'm like, I want to go ride that, and really, I suppose that is somewhat how I've ended up where I am because I've seen all these other people ride mm. these insane slabs and. Yeah, I want to know what it feels like. Like, it looks amazing. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it, yeah, it should be fun and you should be doing it for yourself versus like, oh, this would look cool on my Instagram. Yeah, I think it's an important kind of self-check to do on a regular basis because yeah. I know, you know, myself, how, how easy it is to kind of tread that line <laughs> and go from writing to yourself to all of a sudden operating from the, the ego and it only takes a split second to yeah. let the ego take over and drop into something you're not 100 percent yeah <laughs> to kind of you know turn a good day into a bad day and potentially you know set you back even longer so yeah yeah I, I love that philosophy man and i want you to dig in a, a little more you talked about kind of standing at the top of something having a look seeing if it works are you, are you visualizing yourself in kind of a third person right in the line or what are you doing there um <sighs> And I, I have Anastasia, so I, I struggle to visualize things, okay. <laughs> which is uh, which is always fun. But it's yeah, to me, I don't really like third person look at things. Um, I when I look down something, I'm basically looking at braking points. I'm looking right. at compressions. I'm looking at where I want my tires to go. Also looking at okay, if I make this mistake, what's going to be the outcome? Will mm. I be able to go this way? Will I be able to go this way? what is in the way of a mistake um if there's if there's multiple lines like figuring out okay what's the easiest line what's mm. the hardest line um and just yeah trying to trying to break it down kind of part by part versus like imagining it and just again it goes back to my like writing things that are similar so once i've looked at something that i'm a little bit unsure on, i'll go and find something that is similar and and just practice that one thing. So when I go back to that same feature and look at it again, like it, might, it might take me 15 goes going to a feature before I look at it and go, oh, okay, I'm 100% now. Yep. But being able to go away, practice all those things and come back and go 100%, I think it's just, yeah, it's a cool, it's a cool feeling. And mm. the breakdown is kind of fun, honestly. Totally, yeah. Yeah, I love that. Like a really objective view. Where am I going to break? Where's my... You know yeah. my zones of safety where do i have to let the bike run a little bit yeah. i love it and i think it's it's really important uh like you're saying that to be okay with going away practicing and coming yeah. back like i often say to people like you know that rock's always going to be there you don't have to ride it today yeah <laughs> like, yeah there's a, <laughs> the slaps aren't going anywhere <laughs> exactly <laughs> like yeah sure it might be good conditions today but you know there's going to be more good days so yeah no i love that and i, I think you know hearing your perspective there it's a little bit different to mine i'm definitely big on visualizing myself yeah right in the line i'm thinking about all the same things but i find sometimes i'll get caught in this trap of like all of a sudden visualizing myself doing the wrong thing or like visualizing yeah. what could go wrong and then going too far yeah. down that track and almost like rehearsing that in my mind rather than rehearsing what could go right so that's something you know i consciously work on yeah snapping my mind out of. and i think there is 
yeah, I mean, I've looked at multiple, multiple features where it's like, wow, that tree would not be great to hit. <laughs> but it's like, how um, how are you going to not hit that tree? Mm. Like, if, if there is something that's in, in the way, again, like, okay, even if I make this mistake, knowing that you're going to be able to, like, pull yourself away from it, right. or, like, yeah, looking at that specific point of kind of no return. So not being blind to the hazards and just ignoring them, but saying, okay, like, yes, there's a tree there. Yeah. If I ride this, how am I going to deal with it? Yeah. Not, okay, there's a tree there. Holy shit, that tree's going to grow my front wheel. I'm going to go yeah. over the handlebars and snap my wrist. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's, <laughs> there are obstacles everywhere constantly. <laughs> like, you, you have to be, well, not looking at the, uh, the things that you don't want to hit, but you, ne you need to know that they're, they're there and have mm -hmm. the mindset of kind of just looking around them, but knowing, like, sometimes as a as a tree that's really close but sometimes you want to use that tree because it's so close you can use it as a kind of a bouncing point off the roots to move out the way or totally. whatever like knowing how to yeah sometimes you use that obstacle yeah almost like shifting that obstacle to your advantage yeah like, how can i use that tree that's really close to the side yeah of the i love that <laughs> yeah that's a great way now this is a question every every mountain biker wants to hear you answer i'd love to hear you explain your relationship with fear and riding mountain bikes. I know it differs slightly for each person I talk to. Yeah, so, I mean, fears, like everybody has fears. I myself have fears and yeah, like I'm, I'm scared of heights and stuff. <laughs> this is like we were talking so, about beforehand. And yeah. It's super interesting <laughs> considering the height of some of the stuff and the angle that you're riding down. Yeah, yeah and I, again, I, it all comes back to that same thing of, of being 100% confident. Like if I, like I, I have these fears, but if I'm 100% confident, they kind of start to, to go away. And I almost don't allow myself to get those fears, I suppose. Um, like, I, yeah, I've, if, if I go to something and I start getting the, the butterflies, like it's just not going to happen. Um, I'm just not going to, mm. I'm not going to do it. And I, I, I don't like the feeling of like adrenaline and, and all of that. Like I, I just do it for the satisfaction and the feeling of it in the moment. So like if I start getting crazy adrenaline rushes, I just I'm like, no, no, this is this is yeah. not not happening today. You know the first person that said that to me, and I know for someone who if there's anyone listening that's not a mountain biker, it probably sounds insane that like this guy that's <laughs> riding down some of the craziest slabs in the sea of the sky doesn't like adrenaline. Yeah, <laughs> you mountain bike is adrenaline junkies. What's going on? It's like, no, I, I just, I just love the the yeah. feeling of it. Like, yeah, the tires on the dirt mm. and the compressions, and like when something goes so smooth and it just feels amazing. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I don't really like bungee jumping. I don't like doing all of these like adrenaline feel things. Like yeah. to me, it just feels like crazy anxiety, and I. I kind of avoid it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can relate on some level there, dude. I know I've made a million excuses over the years to never bungee jump. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I've always well, said, I still have it. <laughs> but I'm more than happy to ride down. Yeah, I, I, would, I, I unfortunately uh, got bullied into doing it once. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, uh, yeah, one of the scariest moments of my life. I did the, the Whistler bungee okay. jump and yeah. I got up there and I was like, oh my God, I don't think I'm actually going to be able to do this. <laughs> <laughs> so when I, when I got strapped in, I was like, right, if I don't look at down i'm not gonna know what i'm looking at <laughs> so yeah. i just i just stared out at black tusk and they're like oh yeah put your feet on the edge and i walked out <laughs> to the edge and he's like okay on three you're gonna you're gonna jump and i just slowly leant forwards until the point i actually fell <laughs> yep. yeah and then i and then i looked down and i started screaming <laughs> <laughs> yeah it doesn't sound like a nice situation to me and honestly i think you no. know mountain biking is far more friendly especially when you're out there with a good crew that you trust and yeah you know that respects you and your decisions on that day it's yeah such a better vibe yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely so uh bungee jumping aside i wanted to ask you what's a new skill you've learned on the bike lately um i mean everything's progressing like i i I try to move everything on kind of as equally and slowly as it takes. Mm. I think that the biggest thing in the last two years has been, yeah, my, my braking control um, has allowed me to be able to do the things that I am doing. I think the, the weight shift as well. So rather than riding in that kind of general middle position, riding to a very forward position on the bike, weighting that front wheel, 
Mm. Like riding riding that Norco range, that's like as soon as I jumped onto that, that's where the shift started happening. Because that thing has so much traction. <laughs> totally. like, it, it's insane. The the high pivot is unbelievable. Um and it, it wants you to ride forward. Like that rear mm. wheel just grips and tracks. And I, I run dual as a guy is on the bike, so I, I, I want max <laughs> max traction. Um, but the more the more weight you put over the the front wheel, the more grip you have for everything, cornering um, and and braking. So the further further forward you go, um, that then in hand allows you to brake harder, and then the braking controls got better. I think one of the more interesting things that I've learned over the last little bit is to ride amidextrously. So I ride not specific, like I am a left footed rider or left foot forward rider. Uh, but I've taught myself to ride with both feet forwards. Fantastic. Um, so for, for cornering and for off camber sections, being able to swap the feet um, and get into that maximum kind of like open cornering position um, and being able to weight the, the wheel is exactly how I, how I want to. So if I'm going down uh, an off camber section, like if, if turning right, I'll uh, swap my feet over so that my right foot's forward so I can put all of my weight into the my back left which weights the outside and then also weighting that um front handlebar with the left too it just interesting it, yeah it, like it does it does grip more like i'm not a hundred percent with it yet yep. <laughs> it's definitely taking it's taking its time but like i when i first started i literally went to a pump track and it was basically like learning how to ride a bike again like going yeah. going around the pump track with your wrong foot forward, totally <laughs> it was like, like yeah. it was wild. Like just try, like my upper body knew what to do, but my lower body was it's like, what the heck feeling. is going on? <laughs> yeah, man, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, it's something you know I play around with a little bit as well. I definitely yeah. haven't mastered it yet either. Um, but definitely when I'm just out for chill rides or I'm riding, you know, with my girlfriend or something like that, playing around with putting yeah. the opposite foot forward, it's such a weird feeling. It at is first. so weird. But it's so helpful as well, like yeah. what you're saying, cornering and stuff like this. And even just like riding some techie trails here in BC. Yeah. Sometimes you end up in a situation where yeah. you've, you're, you know, you've gone past the point of no return. You're about to drop into a yeah. slab and the wrong foot's fought. It's yeah. disastrous <laughs> if you're not comfortable with that. So like, yeah, yeah, I'm guessing that you, you know, use that same philosophy of growth of going away, practicing on some really yeah. easy stuff, <laughs> taking it back to the hard stuff. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's fantastic. And, you know, while you're out there riding, uh, maybe if you're ever having a tough day or a tough moment or something like that, I'm curious, do you have any <laughs> any, any mottos or anything you're kind of saying to yourself uh, out there? If, yeah, I mean, I, I have the off day every so often. Like some, sometimes I go out and I'm like, wow, I, for some reason, can't break today or <laughs> I can't corner. But it's just, it's just going back to, like, I don't know, just look around you, like, what are you doing? You're, like, you're in Squamish, mm. you know, you've got the chief over there, the beautiful mountains, like, regardless of having a bad day on the bike, it's still a good day in Squamish. Oh, man, I love that. <laughs> yeah, so bringing yourself back to the present and saying, oh, yeah. grateful to be here regardless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like, uh, I think mountain biking should be fun regardless. If you're having a bad time, just, yeah, try and look at the fun part. And, <laughs> like, if, I, if I'm, yeah, if I'm having a useless day cornering, I'll probably just go do some jumps. Love like, it, yeah. But for some reason, the jumps feel good today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. something else. Like just, yeah, just finding what you actually enjoy in that moment and just sticking to that so you are happy. Dude, it's fantastic. I love it. Yeah, not forgetting the, the whole reason we're out there in the first place. I think all of us, anyone that mountain <laughs> yeah. bikes or rides a bike, is to have fun. Yeah, it, <laughs> so it's you're supposed to be fun. fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, how can I change this day around so that I can have fun today? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic so i want to talk a little bit about some of the work you do with other riders as a coach in a second yeah. um before we do that I'm, I'm curious um obviously you've probably had a few mentors over the years <laughs> is there any like one bit of advice or one thing that a mentor gave to you uh that comes to mind um oh yeah i mean i've had some some awesome coaches over the years i don't think there's anything specifically that anyone said that's that has kind of like stuck stuck with me um but just the support throughout the years like speaking to coaches and speaking to other races and stuff and just everyone actually being stoked for everybody like if you if, mm. again if you're out on a bad day like actually bringing people up versus being like oh whatever <laughs> yeah. um yeah I, mean, I think just just the positivity is is the most important thing and out of all the people i've i've coached with like yeah if that coach is a positive coach 
Um, thanks, Rick Jameson. <laughs> um, yeah, it just it just works versus yeah somebody that's more so whatever. Totally, man. Yeah, big believer in a positive mindset. Yeah. That's huge. <laughs> um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about your work. I know you and I were chatting a little bit beforehand about what you're up to, kind of living the dream in the Mount yeah. Blackwell. You could say, yeah. What, what's your day to day kind of look like? Yeah. So I, well, until a few months ago. Um, or oh, sorry, last year uh, was my, my first year of actually being a, a coach, which, um, like I said before, but being a professional mountain biker has always been my dream. That mindset of being a racer has changed, and now it's just as long as I can ride my bike for a living, I am happy. Um, so I did move here in 2019 for coaching and guiding. Um, it's always been my dream to, to guide in, in Squamish. Um, more, more so guiding than coaching, honestly, okay. for now. Um, I really want to get into coaching, but I see that as kind of a later life thing. Um, but I still, I still really enjoy coaching, and honestly, the guiding turns into coaching. But uh, yeah, mo- moved here, and then COVID happened, right. <laughs> so so I didn't, I didn't get to to actually start guiding for for two years. So I just yeah, worked I in bike shops, and I was uh, working for like a rental company, which was really fun. Okay, um, and then last year was my first year of actual, yeah, being a professional man but yeah, great I guess man, that um, must have been such a good feeling after you know what became a bit of a long road with COVID there and yeah, realizing your yeah. goal of becoming a guide yeah, bet- yeah. yeah between between the games ending and then <laughs> coming out in COVID it was like mm. finally it's happening <laughs> um yeah so it's so a last summer was the the first year and absolutely loved it yeah just going out biking every every day and yeah off days was biking as well um, doing coaching and guiding. Unfortunately, yeah, mid through last season, whilst I was coaching, I had an unfortunate crash and broke my kneecap. Um, always wear knee pads. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this was yeah. I it was such a such a silly mistake um, because I like every time I go riding, I wear a full face chest protector, knee pads, gloves, everything. Mm. Um, because yeah, anything can happen at any time. <laughs> Normally, crash on the uphills. Uh, but when I went out coaching this this one day, uh, or whenever I go out co- coaching last year, I was kind of in the mindset of like, you're riding as chill as possible. You're just focusing on the rider. Like it's aggressive if you're coaching in a full face helmet too. Totally. So I would go out with a half shell, gloves, and nothing else. And this one particular day, so like I was saying, I ride clips. Well, I had to to borrow an e-bike that day. Haven't really ridden e-bikes very much at all, um, and it had flat pedals on it. So I coach uh, this gentleman down the uh, the first slab on Rupert's Road. If anyone knows that first long slab at the kind of towards the end of it, there's one steep roll. Um, yeah, I was coaching him through there, explained it all. He rode it perfectly. I then went back up, jumped on the e-bike, went to go meet him down at the bottom, and just before the roll somehow it's again this is not the bike's fault it's my fault but whatever both my feet slipped off the pedals and as the front wheel just started to go down so my feet slipped off i land on the saddle and seat bounce as the front wheel is going down so the bike's just leaving me i'm going up and it was the most it was a, a horrible like completely unweighted feeling of yeah, whatever. So I, I tried to do the old cross country handlebars through the legs and jump out onto your feet, but the <sighs> e bike weighed sixty pounds or whatever. So I tr- I tried, but couldn't get. I couldn't push the bike underneath me. So then I had to straighten the bars out. But I've now got my left hand and both my feet off the pedal with spread eagle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I landed and yeah, just knife jacked and and hit my knee and well after coaching him down the rest of Rupert's and then Pample Moose and then riding from. <laughs> <laughs> from uh, the bottom of the trails all the way back up to Quest and then riding from Quest all the way to uh, the brewery <laughs> uh, was when I yeah went and got it checked out, unfortunately. Oh, so I en- ended up working in a bike shop and then um, when the, the bike shop ended, I had a, a little bit of money save, saved up and kind of started the journey to where I am now, which is trying to get sponsors and trying to get funding to kind of be able to do this social media thing more and more. Um, So yeah, like a a day in the life now, kind of, yeah, wake up, make make my Instagram post, have a coffee, Um, normally go for a ride where 
still waiting for the season to kind of kick off for the for the coaching really um and and the guiding but hopefully next month that will will start up and i'll be doing that pretty much uh, every day uh and then yeah just make an instagram clips i guess yeah, that's fantastic what a journey yeah like, thank you for for telling us about your crash there like yeah so i just started randomly that, going like, into that <laughs> like yeah i can relate there i've had some really silly crashes being out coaching too and oftentimes on a bike that's not mine maybe the brakes are around yeah. the wrong way the canadian way yeah um, <laughs> no, yeah i'm mine the same way as you but <laughs> again yeah you can't blame the equipment but it's definitely not a nice feeling whether you're coaching or not you know just crashing on on something that we're so sure of. So I think it was a really important point I wanted to highlight there. You said always wear your knee pads. Yeah, and, always uh, wear knee pads. <laughs> shout out to Gordy from Endless Biking that if he's listening, I know he had a really similar crash last season, you know, going out to pre-ride something for a lesson the next day, yeah. not wearing knee pads because it was easy for him. And yeah. same kind of thing, it led to the, the rest of the season off the bike and, you know, a yeah. whole lot of uh, nasty rehab there. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's always when it happens when you're not. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like anyone that's been mountain biking long enough knows that sometimes we crash on easy stuff. Yeah. The car sometimes park no is the it. most dangerous place. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, I think, you know, wearing that protective equipment is a good way to keep your ride going all season. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic, dude. Um, so yeah, love that transition from, you know, going from, you know, working in bike shops, coaching, yeah. guiding, and now, you know, putting, you know, lots of time and lots of energy into creating some really good online content there as well. Yeah. Let's talk about your YouTube channel. What's that all, what's that all about? Yeah, so the, the YouTube channel is definitely something I'm starting this year, really. I kind of played around last year with some videos. Um, like I posted race runs from the enduro that we did. Um, yeah, that was the Squamish enduro last year. Yeah, yeah that was so fantastic fun. Race. Um, and just like some some practice kind of stuff. But to, to make this journey a viable journey, I think YouTube is really the way to, to try and make money because mm. um, there's no creator fund here for, for athletes. So like from, from my Instagram clips and stuff, like I haven't made a cent. <laughs> uh, so the, the YouTube is and the monetization is definitely the, the way to go. So basically it's why I'm going there. But um, when I first moved here as part of me wanting to be a guide, I want to try and document every trail in Squamish. Um, so my, my kind of goal this this summer, which I, I guess this is really the first time I'm talking about it publicly, but I want to try and document every trail in Squamish and do like a trail preview on it. Um, so that's basically where the, the YouTube channel is gonna gonna go. Anything extra that I do, so if there is some gnarly slab that I want to go and do, like I'll, I'm gonna try and document that, the process um of probably doing it maybe not the uh, 15 times going there and walking away <laughs> but but maybe like the first time i'm i'm looking at something and then be like yeah i came back this many times and trying to do that but the, the main the main goal is trail previews um i think i'm just going to do it pov versus like doing third person but when there's multiple lines like just preview every single multiple line and yeah, hopefully bring the trails of Squamish to, to everybody and people will be able to look at the previews and decide whether that trail is for for them or not. And then working as a as a guide, people can go on to the YouTube channel and be like, oh, I saw this trail and that trail. And they'll be able to kind of pick and choose what they want to ride, kind of. And if I can connect those all together, then yeah, we'll go and have a sweet ride. Fantastic, man. Yeah, it's definitely inspiring. And I think we live in such a cool time where we can look up a trail before we ride it we get a sense of yeah. what's going to be going on i know for me you know it really helps with the mentality as well yeah taking away some of those unknowns if a buddy wants to go and ride a trail and i'm like yeah oh this one's up in whistler i haven't been there very much yeah like, what's that all about <laughs> usually i can find it on youtube and i'm like okay it's got slabs it's got rocks it's yeah got roots. i ride that stuff all the time cool let's go yeah yeah no it, it, it is it is cool person Lee, I I honestly don't watch trail previews. Okay, interesting. <laughs> I, yep. I I kind of just go out and yep. and ride, and I, I just love the the explanation of it. Like the first three years I was in Squamish, like I didn't look at trail forks, didn't do anything. I knew the trail, the climbing trail, yep. and I knew if I went down, I'd end up somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so it. like the, the first yeah, the first few years, like I was literally just explore. I, I'm not amazing at knowing the trail names. Cause I've ridden pretty much everything. But I've just gone to it and found it and ridden it versus like looking it up. I think, I think there's there's still so much fun in being able to just go out on a bike and explore. 
I think there is some part of it of the watching trail views that takes it a little bit away from from riding but it is also a really valuable tool yeah yeah man totally i agree with both sides of that and yeah i yeah. totally do a little bit of both myself yeah yeah i wanted to talk there you know you're obviously so good at going out and embracing challenges on the bike just this year and maybe even the last couple of years i know you're putting a lot of your energy into embracing the challenge of trying to make this passion a full-time gig for you yeah um so yeah big big ups to you for doing that man i know yeah, thanks. you know the struggle of of going out and putting yourself out there constantly yeah and even you know some of that second guessing and self-doubt we all get can sometimes be harder than riding the nally stride line yeah <laughs> so. yeah the, i think the, the riding part for me is definitely the the easiest and coming up with a caption for every video is normally the <laughs> scariest part of it <laughs> totally yeah the social media is definitely a, a dark place sometimes or a you know intimidating place to find yourself yeah it's uh it's interesting i think you definitely just have to take it for for the lightheartedness that you possibly can or mm. as sorry as as lightheartedly as you can like it's it's not real like th I these agree. these people aren't saying it to your face they're yeah. just typing online anyone can type anything online and yeah like i mean the amount of comments that i get on my own videos it just ridiculous comments and <laughs> it's like i find amazing i'm like how does someone riding mountain bikes having fun get like online haters that oh, sort of thing. yeah it's incredible like i i've had accounts where that person has commented on every single video something negative and to me i i, I kind of find it funny yeah. I, I it doesn't bother me whatsoever i laugh every single time someone sends me one of these messages <laughs> or, or comments on a on a video like i i totally get it like to me i watch some extreme videos out there things that i personally don't understand like other yeah, people that jump on skyscrapers and stuff and yeah. like yeah i'm like oh my gosh just crazy yeah um and so I, I totally get it yeah if you don't understand the sport like it it does look crazy to to yeah. people um but yeah like the the comments like people are like oh what hospital is is he in can i go check him <laughs> <laughs> like like wow do you really want to die like yeah. what do your parents think of the, the, the oh, comments are it's hilarious insane. Yeah. and it's it's a lot too like mm. there is a lot of comments like like that but it's just, yeah it's funny <laughs> yeah yeah i think you've got it like you say look at the humorous side of it like you yeah know, what's making someone feel called called to spend time writing <laughs> you know, like hateful or negative comments like what what's going on for them to them to feel you know yeah badly enough to have to write this stuff to other people yeah i think oh, and, yeah. i mean everyone has an opinion everyone has something to to say and it's just yeah it's it's all ridiculous yeah so it's, it's not real <laughs> no you're right and I, I think you know sometimes it's harder being the person that's uploading the content and writing the stuff we'll often put more thought into the comment that someone else has wrote yeah than the person <laughs> who actually just really quickly wrote something yeah. they thought was funny yeah like it, it, it off. Yeah. It, it's so easy to just write something horrible on someone's <laughs> someone's page with it they're not gonna say that to your face and, yeah. and the amount i think the amount of positivity too is is really awesome like i'm I'm lucky to have wicked friends and even my my followers like there's there's some awesome people out there that I talk to and they're always commenting on my videos and yeah it's it's a really nice kind of community that seems to be growing around whatever I'm doing yeah man it's fantastic just the the mountain bike community as a whole yeah. that has now also grown online to be like you say overwhelmingly positive yeah I'm sure we're always gonna have a few keyboard warriors but that's yeah fine, whatever. <laughs> overwhelmingly it's such a, a great uh community yeah. yeah i'm sure something you've had commented on about something that sparked my curiosity it was the rubber ducky on the handlebars <laughs> tell me about that one yeah mr uh, mr quacky chan legend <laughs> um yeah the duck thing's been going for a long time <laughs> i think my mum bought me a huge rubber duck for for one of my birthdays when i was like 13 or 14 or something and i was like this thing's sweet and then it just became a thing where yeah like every birthday i'd get like ducks and <laughs> christmas i get ducks like a shakespeare duck like a rasta duck and like all these ridiculous ducks up on my <laughs> mantelpiece and then like it was like, being at school at that age 13 or something that was when i also um like made my first ever email <laughs> so my first email and i still do have the account is yeah, mr ducky um 
I won't give the full email because people will start emailing me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, like, and I yeah I've always had that email. And then yeah, like I mean, it was it was through through COVID and like things weren't going amazingly that all of a sudden one day I had a squeaky duck come in the mail for my handlebars. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, my my mum denied sending it, but it was my mum. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, just just put it on my handlebars and it started as a complete joke, kind yeah. of like the moustache. Um, <laughs> we'll like, yeah, these things just seem to stick. <laughs> but the uh, yeah, I put on my put on my handlebars, mm. like fully just like, oh, it's a little buddy running along, like it squeaks. I really enjoy doing it, uh, squeaking the duck when there's dogs around because okay yeah <laughs> obviously they immediately like oh, what's that <laughs> come running over i haven't successfully stolen a trail dog yet but you know it's it's on the cards <laughs> one, right. one day i'm gonna get a dog <laughs> dog walkers in school yeah. Be careful. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's hilarious I'll, I'll ride past someone there and they're like calling their dog to them and i'll just squeak the dog and it will come immediately over like here you go <laughs> got him yeah, that's yeah it's, it's it's awesome and yeah so it started out as a joke and the first video I posted, I had random people that I'd never seen following me start commenting on it. Like, that's hilarious. That's funny. And it's like, oh, like it's it's really hard to stand out in the mountain bike industry. Mm. Like everyone's doing similar-ish things. And yeah, there wasn't anyone r- high up riding with a duck on their hand. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So as ridiculous as the joke started, I was like, this is a, actually quite a good way to stand out. Yeah. And it's also just fun. Totally. Like mountain biking is supposed to be fun. Anyone that ever comments on it, like, it's ridiculous, it's stupid. It's like, well, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's, why it's like fun. The, that's the whole point of it. Yeah. Like it. It's just hilarious, and yeah, it's, it's kind of fun. It's kind of brought its own identity to to the riding. Of I have lots of things planned for the duck, um, which I'll hopefully get around to doing one day. But yeah, it's just fun. Right, can't wait to see uh, what's in the future for the <laughs> duck there. But if anyone hasn't seen it, check out all his YouTube or all his Instagram. I know, admittedly, same thing for me. First. I think yeah. when I started following you, you know, I'm scrolling through reels and I'm like, who's this guy squeezing a rubber ducky <laughs> mid, mid-gap jump? Like in the yeah, uh, It's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, the duck's takes, awesome. Uh, it takes I, one-handers to a whole new level. Yeah. Oh, it makes it so much more fun. My, my record is six taps. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know it's how many. It's got to be like what, a, what a Whistler, <laughs> A-Line or Dirt Merchant jump. Really. <laughs> <laughs> it was a step up at Kamloops. Oh, there you go. The, uh, yeah. The big one. Yeah. Quack, 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 quack. It's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. The, the favorite, if it jumps big enough, you can do a double duck tap to T-Bog, which is my favorite. But <laughs> so... Yeah, it's, it's so ridiculous. It, it, it's so fun, like going out onto the trails now, and like the kids will see it, and they're like, "Squeak the dog, squeak the dog." Like, <laughs> they, even if they, if they do or don't know me, or like, I'll be going for a ride, and it's like, "Hey, it's the duck guy." And I'm like, "Oh gosh," but it's just fun. Oh yeah. man, that's hilarious. I love it. It's uh, it's always cool to see someone bring just some random new refreshing <laughs> thing uh, to the industry that no one else is doing. Yeah, um, I wanted to talk to you like a little bit more about your work as a as a coach and as a guide. Yeah. Because uh, it's always interesting, you know, hearing different perspectives. Um, so you're obviously out there, you know, taking a lot of newer riders out, showing them yeah. different trails. If there's any common ground there, what's one of the, the biggest things that you see or the biggest obstacles you see someone facing when they're out there in their first couple of seasons of mountain biking? Yeah, I think the mental side of it, like it's uh, it's scary getting into mountain biking. Oh, it's a hard like, it, Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a particularly easy sport. And it's not like skiing where if you crash, you're going to be like really fine. <laughs> like if it, It's easy to, to kind of hurt yourself. So I think people getting over the, the mindset of like, I'm going to crash, I'm going to crash um, is important. And I think people's incorrect technique. I think there's, there's a huge thing in mountain biking where like a buddy will want to get into riding and their, their friends are like, Here's a bike. Let's go. Totally. And they go biking. Yeah. But like to me, it's like putting someone in a manual car that's never driven a manual car, and you're like, "Hey, can you get you know, just drive over yeah. there?" And it's like, "Yeah, they're gonna make, they'll make it. It's not gonna be pretty, <laughs> and it's not gonna be fun, but they are gonna make it." Totally. So, for me, like whether you go out with a coach or you go out with somebody that knows what they're doing, I think just going to a parking lot and actually practicing techniques and and again like making mistakes like 
one thing for, for people getting into sport. Go and practice corners. Grab your brakes mid-corner. But purposely slide the front wheel. Do it on some gravel or somewhere that you know you're going to be able to catch yourself. Mm. And so that you can make that mistake that if it ever happens on a, on a trail, rather than crashing, you, you somewhat know how to, to fix that mistake. And it's, again, yeah, people's mentality of like, I'm going to crash is really daunting. And if, if that's what you constantly have in your mind, it's more likely to happen. Whereas, yeah, if you've gone out and you've learned how to do a bunny hop, you've learned how to do a little bit of cornering, you just have that there in your arsenal mm. of tricks to, to be able to just keep your confidence going. And not progressing too fast, too. I think there's a lot of people um, and friends, Connor, <laughs> <laughs> calling you oh, out. I call um, yeah, and it's like, it's like they see jumps and they're like, I want to do jumps. And it's like, how high can you bunny hop? Or like, how good is your manual? Mm. Or... That and they're like, oh, you can't do any of it. So, you probably shouldn't be starting to do jumps yet. Um, like l again, learning at the little basics and then slowly being out, like finding a step up and and riding it slow, riding it faster, putting out points there that you're like, okay, I want to try and land with my front wheel on this mm. and try and go faster, try and go slower and still hit that point. Like you're gonna have to pull up more and mm. yeah, just slowly actually learning the correct skills so that you don't kind of have the bad mindset and the bad skills that are going to hinder you. Totally, man. So much wisdom in there we could unpack. <laughs> I, I love that whole philosophy. It's, yeah. It's, it's fantastic. <laughs> and it's so cool to hear from someone, you know, a lot of the time with YouTube and Instagram these days, we see the gnarliest stuff you're doing. Yeah. You know, we're not seeing the day where your knees hurting and you're running yeah. around town, <laughs> maybe going to the brewery. We're seeing when you're riding down the steepest slabs and the biggest gap jumps. So it's yeah. so cool to hear that you're also following this same process. And, you know, I like the term incremental progression. Yeah. But, you know, progressing in little increments rather than maybe a, a more destructive progression where we're <laughs> trying to progress really fast. Yeah. We're going from learning how to use our brakes for the first time to learning to do a gap jump. It's too yeah. fast. It's going to end yeah. with destruction. We're going to crash going to have setbacks it's going to be slower in the end yeah than if we just take things slow trust that process and yeah and really hone it and i love what you're saying there again about you know failing but putting yourself in a situation where you can fail well yeah so if you're learning to wash out on the not learning to wash out on the front wheel learning what it feels like yeah to wash out on the front wheel yeah that in a gravel parking lot or in a super easy corner where maybe yeah. the worst thing that could possibly happen is you sprain your ankle you're yeah. probably just going to put your foot down and not even fall off the bike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so rather than having that happen on A-line when you're going 50 kilometers an hour. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, less ideal. <laughs> yeah. No, parking lot is everybody's, everybody's friend, and I don't think anyone should ever stop playing in a parking lot. Totally. I think one of the things I love most about mountain biking is it reminds me how to be a kid. It yeah. makes me feel like being a kid again. Yeah. Nothing makes me feel like a kid more <laughs> than doing something goofy in a parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Messing something up and maybe having yeah. a bit of a tumble in the parking lot. Yeah. So. And you know what? Like making those mistakes and crashing rather than looking at it as like a bad thing. Like mm. it is fun. You know what? Like sliding your front wheel out and catching yourself with your foot. Like maybe you're going to go down and you're going to scrape your 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 uh, elbow whatever but it's still it's still fun like you're just out there messing about and it always yeah it should always just be fun totally yeah i think a lot of the time as an adult it becomes almost like this oh i can't crash crashing's bad yeah you know, often we're worried about all the you know our adult responsibilities yeah and for sure that's that's fine but i do like to embrace some of that childhood mindset sometimes of like yeah. i'm just out here riding a bike like my goal is not to do well or do bad i just yeah ride yeah. If I crash, that's funny. If yeah. And something. <laughs> Great. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah uh, crashing on mountain bikes is definitely a lot more fun than road bikes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Sometimes, you know, rocks and roots and slabs and trees, there's so much more stuff to hit. But often, you know, the injury or the consequence isn't as bad as just. Yeah. No, to tarmac's know, tarmac. a lot less. Yeah. It's, it's not often you crash on a road bike and you go, wow, that was fun. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, that never happens. Whereas on a mountain bike, it's it's the majority of the time. Like you naturally aim for the bushes, mm. aim for the bushes. <laughs> there we go. So we didn't get too much into how to crash before, but that's a good tip. Um, yeah, for the soft stuff if you are falling. <laughs> I love it. So you've obviously been out riding with a whole bunch of different people uh, throughout your life and your career. I'm curious, is that one thing or one kind of? Uh, yeah, I guess one thing that someone has taught you, one of your students has taught you, or during the process of teaching them, you've learned about yourself. 
I think just the the process of learning is always awesome. Like the different ways that people people learn things is always really interesting. Mm. I don't think I, like yeah, I've definitely learned about the coaching process through people. Um, I've definitely learned a lot about random things from mm. from awesome customers. Good. Okay, I totally <laughs> relate. It's I think it's fantastic uh one to give someone else some knowledge and you know give give them a funny experience through some of yeah. the stuff you've learned over the years but it also helps you learn more about that skill yourself yeah. or more about yourself as a writer yeah so. and coaching and actually breaking things down it, it mm-hmm. doesn't just improve somebody else's writing it definitely improves your own writing because you, you have to think about it like there's it's funny asking some really really good mountain bikers you know, how do you do that yeah and they're like i just did it yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, which is uh, something me trying to be a coach is something I'm trying to kind of learn out myself yeah. too is like actually like rather than just doing something be like how exactly did that just just happen and work um, yeah it's really interesting yeah it is exactly and it kind of leads us back around to you know having a crash or an injury or a setback I think often if we're just doing something it always works it always works well yeah that's all we know yeah. And then it can be even harder sometimes if we maybe do have a crash or an injury or a setback. Yeah. All of a sudden we can't operate from that same place. And, you know, it can yeah. be like really self-defeating to be like, oh, I, I just can't do it anymore. Yeah. Whereas, you know, if we've learned maybe the other way or breaking things down, we're like, okay, well, I'm just, I understand where I am now. I'm back to the start of that process. Yeah. I just have to climb that same ladder again. Yeah. And I can be back there, but I can see the path. Yeah. Oh, and I think it is really important having that path because things will go wrong things always will go wrong. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it's, it, yeah, Mike, and it's pretty much impossible to always have things go, right? Mm. It's a part of life. And I, I think it is really important to to plan for, you know, okay, if the worst case scenario happens here, but don't end there. Don't end thinking about the worst case yeah. scenario. It's like, if the worst case scenario happens, how can I get back to where I am now? Yeah. Or how can I get back online? How can I bring myself yeah. back? That can often be, you know, confidence inspiring rather than just thinking about, you know, the route that's going to catch your front tire and uh, yeah. whatever else. <laughs> no, I love it, man. I know before, you know, we're talking a lot about your YouTube and stuff, and I know I'm jumping around a little bit here, yeah, but no I did want to give you the opportunity to mention, you know, some of the partnerships you've built in the industry and some of the sponsors that are helping you make all this wonderful stuff happen. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really, really lucky to have the, the sponsors I've got. I genuinely never thought I'd get to where I am and I, I still can't believe what's going on. Um, but yeah, the f- first brand that I was speaking to was Anomaly um, with the, the switch grade. And that, the, the saddle adjuster, for anyone that doesn't know what an Anomaly switch grade is, it's, um, it goes at the top of your, your seat post, so it works with a, a dropper. Um, but you can angle your saddle forwards, uh, so like tilt it down. You can have it flat and you can also have it up. So okay. thinking of it like a downhill setup when you're going downhill, so that it's yeah tilted back, you got flat for doing flat round, and then tilted forward for, for climbing. Um, and for, yeah, for me, tilting that saddle forward was something that I'd always play with. So with cross country racing, if you're, if you're climbing uphill and you're racing uphill, you don't want your saddle to be in that flat position because as soon as you start going uphill, it's actually tilted backwards, <laughs> <laughs> which, which is fine, but it's going to rotate your hips backwards. It's going to then put more strain into your back. You then can't put as much power down. Um, you also can't sit into that rear wheel as hard, so you haven't got as much traction. Um, and yeah, so so Anomaly contacted me, uh, and yeah, the this the switch grade is amazing. Being able to actually tilt it forward just for, for pure comfort is is fantastic, and the amount of grip you get on climbing too is is awesome. It just saves your body. It's one of the things a lot a lot of people don't really think it's necessary, and I've had lots and lots of comments about about it being an unnecessary thing. But go for a ride yeah. up a hill and tilt your saddle a little bit forward and just see how it feels like once you once you do it once you realize the benefit and you're like oh i, I can't ride a bike now without one really? like it just feels wrong not being able to have the perfect saddle position wow. and i use it more on my dropper post too like I, I will constantly be twitching it in between 
No, I didn't even realize that just cruising down the road at the end of the ride, if your saddle's flat, you're like being pushed forwards. Whereas if you tilt it backwards like a downhill bike, you're just cruising. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it, Man, it's awesome. It's so um, cool to hear that first person's perspective because I know like every mountain bike park, I see it all over my social media yeah. all the time. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. But I haven't given it much more thought. I'm going to have to definitely try it on your bike when we go for a <laughs> yeah, ride. Yeah, we go for a ride. Well, yeah, yeah. Be, be careful because... Yeah, they're I'll really probably, good. Yeah, all the ones tonight. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah, so um, and anyone that's had a go on one is is bored pretty much. No, like really cool to hear because I know you know you've got back problems. I get a sore back sometimes when yeah. I'm out, you know, doing long days in the saddle. I'll often be riding like up a climbing trail with just my fingertips on the bars. Yeah, I'm trying to straighten my back out. Yeah, um, and so. oh, it helps so much with with that. I mean, actually, that's a, another funny thing. People look at my bike and they're like, "Wow, your stack height is crazy high," <laughs> and it is crazy high. Yeah, I've got like. 50 to 60 mil underneath the stem i honestly can't remember yeah, then you've and got... i've got 50 mil riser bars on <laughs> it too like it's it's so high it's not for going downhill it's actually for my back for climbing wow, yeah. <laughs> interesting yeah um but yeah anyway so yeah and only was the the first people that i um got contacted with and yeah couldn't believe that and then that same year norco reached out and they wanted to put a video on their instagram and that's right. kind of like how things started and just got talking to them and yeah i can't believe I'm riding for Norco. Thank you so much, oh, guys. Yeah, huge congratulations. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's it just, just feels so rad yeah, to have I, support I, after years of, you know, scrounging <laughs> all of your spare change to buy bike parts and bikes yourself. Yeah, I mean, that was really the, the, necess- the, oh my God, the necessity of riding, uh, working in a bike shop was mm. to be able to afford my <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my <literally>. addiction. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so yeah, and I've I've... I've loved Norco bikes for for years and being able to not only ride, well, be sponsored by a brand, but be sponsored by the brand that I really want to be sponsored by. I just feel so lucky. Um, Yeah, Noble Wheels, again, a really family-oriented kind of brand. Like everyone I've spoken to is really, really nice. The wheels are awesome. The ability to go on there and customize any wheels that you kind of want with whatever hubs, it's, it's just awesome. And I, with all the brands that I'm riding for, like I have only chosen brands that I 100% trust and, and believe in. I have turned down brands that I just don't believe in. Like, I, I would rather not, yeah, get components or be paid to promote something that I don't genuinely believe in because I just don't think that's the, mm. the right thing to do. And then, yeah, the family side, like, I, if I'm speaking to a brand, I want it to feel good. Like, I, yeah. I want to actually be speaking to somebody and, yeah, Noble is, like, a, yeah, just an awesome brand. Um, title as well. Yeah, mm. I really like it to be riding on on title stuff. Yeah, man, you get some rad components on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. The title bars are, are sweet, and again, I was riding those all last year, and um, yeah, unbelievably lucky to, to continue that on. You, so. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like, I I ride things I trust, and if yeah. I build trust in something, I will continue to ride it. I don't see the need to yeah. to change things. Um, North Shore billet as well. Nice. I love CNC parts. <laughs> yeah, who doesn't that? Uh, like they having everything up in and in, in Whistler and being built in Whistler mm. is is just really cool to have a, a local brand making yeah. amazing components. There's some pretty exciting things coming out, and yeah, all their products just keep getting better and better. Like everything that I've put onto my bike has just felt right. Like I've n- I've never had something and been like that feels. I know I've had components before where you like tighten something up and you're like. <laughs> not sure about uh, the feeling of it whereas these yeah. like, you almost don't notice and they just feel right yeah well made stuff definitely makes a difference yeah. hey? and it, it plays into the mindset as well doesn't it it's like yeah if you're confident in your setup you're not going to be thinking about that when you're dropping into something yeah you that is something you do not want to be worrying about yeah. is your actual bike before you go down something <laughs> um and yeah and nrg as well the distributor they they've helped me out and yeah max's okay. tires Fantastic. i absolutely love max's tires oh, yeah. i don't want to ride anything else <laughs> um so using those galfa rotors um yeah and kushcore as well riding for, for kushcore i was using kushcore in my wheels all last year after breaking three alloy rims <laughs> <laughs> um yeah kushcore finally Fantastic. actually managed to stop me breaking rims but also the the traction that you you get riding off camber stuff especially like okay. the, the sidewall support that it puts into the tires really nice it's not mm. like folding over itself and for me riding down these 
silly stabs. I want as much grip as I possibly can. So running like 15 PSI in the right. tires or whatever, being able to know that I can smash that front wheel into something and it's still going to grip, it's still going to hold. I, also having the lower tire pressure is, mm. is fantastic. I love it, man. It sounds like quite the dream uh, dream setup you got there. It is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Congrats, because like you say, you know, you're feeling super lucky that you've got out, you've done the work, you've put in so much work into this. So yeah, yeah, no, good stuff, man. I love dream it. Dream come true. <laughs> <laughs> now I've got to respect your time here and make sure we get out for a ride while it's still sunny. Yeah. But I do have a couple of questions I want to go kind of ask before the end. Yeah. We got a couple from our followers on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> the first one of those. What does he do to maintain that majestic stash? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, the stash is uh, quite the mantelpiece, as I say. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a pair of scissors that I trim the bottom with, get it all perfect, <laughs> uh, and then I use hand soap there to curl it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've used mustache wax and stuff in the past. Uh, the best thing I've ever found for having the perfect mustache is, uh, yeah, a bar of hand soap. There we I go. use that, like, is it Sierra or something? I don't know. It's like a see-through one, so you don't really see it. Yeah. Because I wet it slightly, put it in, and uh, it works really, really well. <laughs> there you as, go, guys. You That's a scoop. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I didn't know already that you're a mountain biker, I would have asked if you climb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Washed everything with hand soap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can thank my girlfriend for the mustache. She, I grew it out as a joke one time, and it ended up being my Commonwealth Games. Um, well, it it actually ended up being on my passport because <laughs> okay, so it's it, been around for quite some time. Yeah, it was. It was the second year I came out to Canada. I was like, I don't know anyone who's going to grow a mustache. Screw it. So I, I grew it out, went back, and then. Um, yeah, I needed to update my passport and I had old photos and the lady wouldn't allow me to do it. It was also during November and it was like the last few few weeks of it and I was going to shave it off after. But the lady at the um, passport place was like, this photo uh, isn't you. Uh, we need a photo of you currently. And I was like, well, it's November and I'm actually going to shave this off in like, you know, a week or whatever. And she's like, it doesn't look like you. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh. So yeah, I went went to had to go and get new photos. So oh, I had the no. mustache. So, it's just, <laughs> so yeah, my my girlfriend found uh, a photo of me with the mustache and I've been forced to grow it back. <laughs> so you've got to keep it now so that you yeah. can travel. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's hilarious. But no, it's funny and it's a conversation starter, so I love it. Yeah. I know you had a couple more questions there from some of your followers. Yeah, let's uh, uh, I've got pre read these, so this is gonna be fun. Great man. So Here's a good one. Uh, what parts of BC have you not yet explored yet? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's a big place. Yeah, it. I was saying before, it's. I find it really difficult to leave Squamish. Yeah. Like I, the, the trails are so good. It's yeah. what I love riding. Um, so I've ridden in yeah Squamish. I've ridden in Whistler, um, up at Pemberton on the North Shore a few times. I went to Kamloops for a day, went to Invermere for a day. Um, I definitely want to get out and start doing some more exploring and with the YouTube channel, once I've kind of finished my, uh, well, doing every trail here, that's definitely going to be the next goal is to kind of expand out and start doing more more trail previews in different places. I'd love to, to be able to have the funds to kind of do like a bike um, bike park summer too like just go around yeah. to all the bike parts and like kind of document those as well um, but it's yeah all things I can hopefully try and uh, get done yeah maybe not this I don't think it will happen this year but next year yeah fantastic man it's so exciting to hear you yeah. know some, some big plans in the works there uh, here's a question from everyone's favourite trail builders in Squamish, uh, Dream Wizards. <laughs> How many push-ups can you do? Oh, <laughs> uh, no, we, we could find out. <laughs> I Yeah, I'm honest. Like, I, I used to be, in my cross-country days, I did a lot of gym work, which is also part of the reason I've got the back problems. Back then, not... Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I could do a lot of push-ups back then when I was strong. Yeah, N Not so much anymore. But it's, yeah, being strong on the bike is very, very, very important. It's something I kind of have neglected over the last little bit. Um, but it's something I'm, yeah, slowly trying to trying to get back up onto. It is hard, isn't it, when riding bikes is just so fun? 
Yeah. It's hard to want to go and do anything yeah, else. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the gym's all right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I spent so many years in gyms that I just, yeah, I much prefer riding my bike. But it, it definitely is a necessity. And for what I am doing now, you do want to be strong. I've been lucky and got away with a lot because mm. of the technique I've built up over the years. Like, rather, yeah, looking at things, being like, how smoothly can you ride it? Yeah. Um, I've got away with probably a lot more than I should have. <laughs> nice. No, speaking of uh, riding smoothly, a couple of people want it here want to know how to maximize the steez. The steez? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, man, I, personally, I don't think I have much steam. <laughs> being a being a cross country racer, like I, yeah, I, I, well, I used to be a hell of a lot more rigid than I am now, but I, I it's just having fun. Like I, I just have fun. I honestly don't think I have that much style. I think I can do cool things like the endos. Are like it looks cool because it's an endo, but like <laughs> watching someone like Colby, Pringle, or, or yeah, all the other boys, like. There's so much style in the way that they jump and stuff. Like I, I, I wish I had that, but it's just natural. Like these guys just have it naturally. Um, you can build it up, but yeah, go go to jumps and practice and practice and practice and build build the style. <laughs> you humble bet. I do think yeah, the the dirt jumper must help a lot there too. And yeah, you know these guys too for sure. There's a level of natural talent and potential there, but they've also put so many years yeah <laughs> into crafting that. And I'm sure they film themselves an awful lot and yeah, it's affect that style as it's well. It's an art form. Like when Absolutely. you when you start getting to that level, it's not just riding a bike. It it really is art. <laughs> Absolutely. Someone uh, wants to know here, what's your opinion on bicycle reach? Is too long? Too long. Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. I think it, hey, mountain bikes have changed a lot. So like me, me growing up, being a cross country racer, also on Jersey, we didn't really have much mountain biking. So I just worked in road shops my whole life. So I'm a, I'm a qualified uh, bike fitter as well as mechanic and whatever. Um, it's definitely, yeah, it's been interesting watching mountain bikes change because um, reach used to be really important from a like physical point of view. Like you didn't want it to be too far out, too close in for, for pedaling and like fitness. But mountain bikes these days are toys. Like we, the, the, we don't have perfect pedaling positions on these bikes. Like our seat tubes are really far forwards, um, which isn't putting us in a perfect position. So I think it comes down to what you want to ride and what you can ride. So somebody that's racing downhill probably want a longer bike. It's going to be faster. It's going to be more stable. Um, somebody that's doing yeah more jibbing stuff, like it doesn't matter if you're six foot tall. If you're riding a small bike, it's going to be easier to manual. It's going to be easier to bunny hop. It's going to be more fun for a person. Yeah, it's not going to be great for pedaling. You might be hitting your knees and stuff, but just that general fight ride it's kind of these days it's figuring out what you want to do on a bike and then figuring out which bike is going to be the best for that reach is reach like every bike is a different one um and i just think yeah figuring out what's going to play for you the best is going to work like i've ridden large bikes and yeah it was faster and more stable in a straight line but i don't really like, oh, I like doing that, but I much prefer being able to manual bunny hop, like just throw the bike around. So for me, something that's smaller with a higher stack is just a lot more fun. I love it, Matt. Good answer. And again, aren't we just so lucky to live at a time when it's like, <laughs> what kind of riding do you want to do? You yeah. can get the bike for it. It exists. Yeah. It's there. So fantastic. We're going to wrap things up with a couple of quick fire questions here. Go. Who do you look up to in the mountain bike world? Danny McCaskill. Nice. Yeah, I, I he may not be a, f a f full out mountain biker, but just the way that he's always having fun, he's Absolutely. always out there just living it up. His, I mean, the, the things that he does are just incredible. The lines he finds, and I think his mentality towards stuff too, like it just seems like a really really fun guy. And the way he does everything is just yeah, it's fun and nice, and there's no pressure, no ego behind it. Yeah, I love it, man. Yeah, great great rider to look up to. Uh, I know we've talked about a whole lot of different things. I've kind of jumped around all over the place with my questions here. But if you could pick one thing, what's the biggest takeaway that you'd hope listeners would take away and remember from this conversation? Yeah, I, I think, again, just having fun. 
mountain biking is supposed to be fun. We're out in the woods riding effectively kids' toys <laughs> <laughs> in the woods. Like, it's supposed to be fun. If you're not having fun, go and find some way of making it fun. And if you're really not having a good time riding the bike, step away for a little bit. Go back and you'll have a good time. Like, yeah, fun. <laughs> totally that. Could not have said it better myself. Uh, for people wanting to follow along, where can people find you online and follow all the fun? Yeah, so you can go on to Instagram. Uh, my handle is Ollie Lothorpe, Ollie with two L's, I-E. Um, I also have a YouTube channel as well. Um, and yeah, it's exactly the same on there. And yeah, I would love if you uh, came and watched along. Fantastic, dude. I love it. Thanks for such a great conversation. Thanks very much. I've had an absolute <laughs> blast here. Same. And I can't wait to get out on the bike with you. Yeah, let's go riding. Sweet, let's do it. <laughs> Sick. What's up, guys? Just one last thing before you hit the trails. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe and don't be a stranger. I'd love to hear from you about any topics, particular episodes you enjoyed, and even about any guests that you'd like to hear me have on the show in the future. You can find me on Instagram at the underscore mind underscore mountain. This podcast, mountain biking and mindset are all things that are very, very close to my heart. So I feel super grateful to be able to share these conversations with you. Much love to you all for taking the time to listen. See you next time.